Okay, Mass Nerds, welcome to an exciting interview. We have a very exciting special guest today, Nikki Vars McCullough. She is a Vice President of Personal Safety Division within 3M. She's a Mass Nerd herself, and we're here to talk a lot about N95s, all of the exciting products that 3M have, as well as some of those questions that we've all had, like, you know, how do we make sure we're getting legit 3M products? And a lot of the, uh, those kind of topics, reuse discussion, um, we'll have a lot of fun things to talk about. So let me introduce Nikki. Go ahead and say hi, Nikki. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. Oh, that's very awesome. We're excited to have you as well. Um, so I think, Nikki, can you tell us a little bit about your history and background at 3M? How long have you worked there and kind of what have you been working on? Yeah, this year is actually my 25th anniversary of being at 3M. Uh, I came to 3M right after finishing my doctorate in environmental and occupational health here at the University of Minnesota. Um, I started out doing research and design and development of respiratory protection and then expanded into uh, the role I have today, which is really being um, a knowledge leader, providing a lot of training and education, working on regulatory affairs. And I work with a, a group of around 330 people all over the world, located in 49 countries. Well, that, that is pretty amazing. So, so you're, you're pretty much what you're saying is that you've been a mass nerd for like 25 years. Uh, actually, a little more than that, since I researched um, respiratory protection in graduate school. And actually my thesis was on the use of respiratory protection to control airborne infectious diseases. Oh, so. That's it, what I studied 30 years ago um, when I was 12, of course. Um, <laughs> and after that, I came to 3M. They were launching some of their first respirators into the healthcare space. And so that's what I started working on. And here I am 25 years later. Well, that is very exciting. I mean, that sounds like uh, a, a, the perfect place to be uh, in terms of your knowledge base and your experience today right now uh, when we're talking about some of the issues surrounding COVID. Um, so, of course, any mass nerd always has their favorite mask. Now, granted, you work at a company that makes a lot of great options. So I'm very interested to hear what is your go to favorite mask? So I think that's like asking me to pick between my children, to be honest, which one is my favorite. Um, I have a favorite respirator. So my favorite N95 respirator um, probably is the 3M Aura respirators. That's the one that I, I tend to wear when I need to, to really have that level of respiratory protection. So I would say that's my favorite. It's really comfortable. It fits a whole wide range of faces. Uh, we have them with valves and without valves. And I just, I just really like this one. But I like all of the 3M N95 respirators. And, and I think... And I think we'll talk about quite a few of them today, kind of talking about how each of those different products kind of fit within both like face sizing and applications. So for people that are real mass nerds, we will kind of talk about some other uh, offerings from 3M. Now, I think when we get this interview started, there's one thing that well, we'll bring up right away, which is this conversation of mask versus respirators. So you, uh, you know, I think a lot of people view respirators or N95s and often call them masks. Is there a reason why we call them respirators versus a mask? Maybe you might want to have share some thoughts on that. Yeah, prior to the pandemic, actually, there was a lot more sort of division between masks were typically thought of as something that a healthcare provider would wear during surgery, like a surgical mask. And uh, masks are really designed to be a barrier for like splashes coming at your face, or if you're doing surgery to make sure that if you cough or sneeze, it doesn't just go right into the open wound. And respirators, like N95 respirators, are approved by the US government to help filter out things that are in the air that you don't wanna breathe into your body. So masks typically are loose fitting, they don't form a seal to your face, and they might not be tested for things like filtration. But respirators, when I use the term respirator, I'm really referring to things that are approved by the US government and, and are, have tests on filtration, tests on how easy they are to breathe through, are designed to form that seal to your face so that the air is forced through the filter. Okay, so it's really kind of focusing on protecting your lungs versus sort of capturing droplets and all kinds of other kind of miscellaneous things when we talk about masks, which is sort of that droplet protection and sort of general keep stuff out of your mouth versus a respirator, which is really protecting your respiratory system, your lungs. Correct. All right, I think that's a, that's a great segue into the next question that I have. Okay, so, so N95s, uh, to some people, only started hearing about them maybe a year ago, maybe if they're really on the cutting edge a year and a half or two years ago. 
But for a lot of uh, concepts about or three inch production of N95s go kind of really predates you know COVID or even medical use of these. Where does the kind of N95 start with 3M? And kind of how does that transition us to today where we have kind of a kind of wide distribution of different mask options, including like surgical and sort of like the industrial general purpose in 95. Can you kind of tell me a little bit about the history of that from the 3M's perspective? Oh, for sure. We, we're we first going to go way back, way back to uh, the 1960s. And in the 1960s, workers in places like mines and construction sites were using respirators, but they were big rubber face pieces like we might think of that the army might use. And um, workers sometimes didn't need to have such a big face piece. So 3M started working on what we now know is a filtering face piece respirator, um, where the whole body of the respirator was made out of filter media, and it was very lightweight and very easy to breathe through. And in 1972, the U.S. government approved the first version of these single-use filtering face pieces. And that's where 3M uh, first commercialized. Back then, they were called dust mist respirators. And um, that was our, so it's the 50th anniversary of 3M having the first uh, filtering face piece respirator approved by the US government. And um, along the way, the, the regulations changed a little bit. The, the tests that we, we have changed a little bit. Um, and now we call those N95 respirators. But essentially, um, if you looked at our first filtering face piece respirator from 1972 and the one that I'm holding today, they would look very similar. But I can tell you that the, the technology has evolved along the way over 50 years a lot. I, I would imagine. I mean, I, or at least I would hope so. <laughs> I know 3M is very into innovation, so I imagine they've been working on that tirelessly. Now, I think one of the things that kind of have come out of COVID is this kind of term that I hear a lot, which is, uh, medical in 95, medical grade in 95. And a lot of people I think are inferring to what we often call a surgical in 95. Can you tell me a little bit about why, let's say the, the surgical in 95s, how are they different than sort of the ones that we can buy at Home Depot? What is the real difference between those? So all N95 respirators are sort of at the, the base N95 respirators. They are all approved to the same government standard that's um, from NIOSH, which is the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. And all N95s are considered general use or standard respirators. You can use them um, in any workplace. For certain applications, such as use in surgery, um, the Food and Drug Administration requires a couple extra tests. And so for the ones that are, are approved, you know, as surgical N95s, they have also been tested for flammability. And they've got some extra, you know, warnings on the packaging. And they are also tested to make sure that if you're in surgery and you slice open an artery and your, your face is very close, that, that that artery pumping blood at your face is not gonna soak through immediately. Okay. So the surgical N95s, this is a, a surgical version of a 3M N95, and this is sort of a standard use version. You can see they look very similar, uh, but this one's had some extra tests done on it, and it's got some extra requirements for complaints if you make a complaint, uh, because it is used in surgical settings. So, so for the average consumer that would be using it, let's say in terms of respiratory protection for let's say an airborne pathogen like COVID or for dust or something like that, a surgical N95, would still work, but probably really isn't necessary because the, the, the sort of fluid resistance stuff we're talking about isn't really applicable. Um, and so in those kind of scenarios, you could wear them, but there's not really much of a benefit in terms of, of the wearer, right? There's no, there's no additional benefit. No, there, there's really no reason um, that somebody using, uh, a, who was looking for an N95 type protection for flying in an airplane or going to the store or even you know, working on a construction site or teaching school would ever need to have a surgical N95. A standard or general use N95 is, is going to be just fine. And, and sometimes people get a little confused by the term fluid resistance because that's what we call that, that high pressure stream of blood that we test the surgical respirators with. But standard respirators 
are going to resist things like sneezing or coughing or a light rain. Uh, they're designed to be used in that. So a standard or general use respirator is a completely appropriate for anyone outside of a healthcare facility. Okay, that's. I think that's a great point because I think we get a lot of questions, especially around uh, the, the the Aura series, right? Because you have the the 1870 plus with the with the red headbands and the 9205. They look exactly the same, and people oftentimes don't know what is the difference. But I mean, you could wear either one. But it sounds like 9205 is if you like that series is the way to go, or the non, you know, the, the general use or industrial type 95s are are the most practical for most people. So I think one question I also get the probably the next question I get the most is how do I make sure I'm getting a legit 3M? I mean, we heard a lot of stories that happened over the pandemic about you know, fake N95s and fake respirators being manufactured and imported into this country and used. And it's created kind of a, a mess in some ways, which uh, it's kind of the nature of the pandemic. Um, but one of the programs that got introduced uh, or at 3M has had, I don't know for how long, is this uh, 3M safeguard. I was wondering if you could explain a little bit about what is the safeguard and, and how will someone use that and kind of what are the masks that get used with it? Because I think there's you know, as a, as a general person, uh, mass nerd, and just a regular mass nerd, you and I struggle with knowing which is covered by which, but maybe you could tell me a little bit about that program. Yeah, I'm going to go back and kind of start with your first question, which is how do we know we're getting a legitimate N95 respirator, a legitimate 3M N95? And there's a, a couple important things that, that someone can do. Uh, the first thing is if an offer seems too good to be true, then I would look further into it. So if you're seeing somebody selling something at a really cheap price or huge volumes which don't seem practical, then I would look further into that. Um, we always want to look for packaging that has you know, good grammar, the words are all spelled correctly, the pictures are all clear, the colors seem to be sort of the right colors. And then as we look at the different respirators, we want to make sure that they've got the right printing on them. So if there's a, a photo, if you're looking at them in person or if you've got a photograph online, you really want to make sure that you're looking for sort of the, the manufacturer's name, so 3M in this case. And then it, it needs to say NIOSH, N-I-O-S-H, and N95. And there needs to be a model number. So if you're not seeing those things on the front of the respirator, then you can start to question if there's no printing that you can see on the, the respirator body, that's probably not an authentic respirator. And so the best thing you can do then um, is also make sure that if you're buying them, you know, that you buy them from a place that you trust. So if you're buying them online, um, make sure you look at who is the authentic seller, right? Sometimes there's resellers. If you're not recognizing, um, a reseller, or even if it seems like a name that's not a, a, a company that would distribute these types of products, I would call the manufacturers. So 3M has a COVID fraud hotline that you can call. Uh, we've got a website you can look at, and, and that's a way to help um, determine that you're buying from an authorized dealer. And that's true all over the world. We've set up COVID fraud hotlines um, in all the different major areas of the world, Europe and Asia and China and Latin America and here in the U.S. and Canada so that people can get questions answered. Okay. So if, so if you wanted to know if you had an authorized distributor, is there any ways, let's say I, I'm, I'm a person who likes to buy stuff online, right? So I'm lazy. I'm, I mean, I know that Home Depot carries 3M uh, products. I have some pictures that I tweeted out of nice, uh, all those nice masks hanging out there as well as other manufacturers. I think Target carries um, CVS I saw recently had the 3025 or 9025 uh, mask as well. But is there, uh, if you're going to go buy online, let's say I want to buy on Amazon, what is the best way to get the 3M mask on Amazon in your, in, in from, from 3M's perspective? How do, you, how do you recommend us to purchase through them? Um, so first I would look at, you know, is Amazon the actual, if you're buying from Amazon, is Amazon the one actually selling you the product? If you're seeing a reseller that you don't recognize as, as a major distributor of these types of products, then that's one, one way to um, be questioning. Okay. If you go on to, to 3M websites, we do have directions of sort of where to buy. And so it'll help bring you to the right pages and the okay. right dealers and distributors. So th that's so the best way. And if you're looking and, and it looks like there's been, you know, multiple resellers or something, that's when you should... It doesn't mean they're not authentic. It just means you need to do a little bit more homework. So when we're talking about looking at 
uh, Amazon, we want to look for that, that ship by Amazon and sold by Amazon is usually going to be the best way to ensure it. Correct. Or, you know, any of the other major web retailers is, is just to look for that. And if you see it's, it's a reseller, again, it doesn't mean they're not authentic. It just means that you might need to contact 3M um, and do a little more homework to make sure that this is a, a, you know, an authorized dealer. And again, look at the pictures, right? Make sure that there's printing on the, the face piece of the respirator. Uh, make sure that the, the packaging looks to be authentic. The words are all spelled correctly. The sentences make sense. Okay. And if you have any suspicions, if you do find something you think is fraudulent, then we definitely ask that you go to the 3M uh, website. The 3M, if you go to 3M's website, myn95.com is a website that you can go to and get connected to our COVID fraud reporting pages or get your questions answered. Okay, and we'll link and we'll put a link to all of the websites we're talking about right now. There'll be a link below in the description for anyone who's watching and kind of want to hit those sites. Now, I was on the site earlier uh, this week looking for I, you know my favorite mask is one of the is the 9105B Flex and it's very hard to get right now. Now I noticed that if you went to the website to purchase it, 3M now lists uh, uh, stocking at authorized uh, re, um, distributors as well. If, do I understand that correctly? That authorized distributors who maybe participate in some program will list their stocking available right on the 3M website if you go to the specific product type? Yeah, I think that that is uh, determined really by which dealer you're working with and which ones okay. choose to participate. But I would say that that starting with the 3M websites is always the best place to start. And then we can help send you to a distributor who's got stuff in stock. Okay. And and big box retailers. So if we want to pick, if we want to buy in person, um, big box retailers like Home Depot, let's say Menards, uh, anyone who carries 3M products, those are always going to be a really great source to get legit because you usually typically are going to distribute directly to those suppliers, correct? That's correct. And that's why we've got on these on these pages again, you can go to 3m.com slash my N95. And it'll take you to pages on where to buy and then it will get you there. And you know, before you go into the store, just like with anything else, make sure they're in stock at, at the store you wanna go into. Uh, because really local availability really depends on what's going on. Are there any other factors like wildfires? Um, so be sure to check before you, you know, go on down to a store, just like with any other product. Yeah, yeah, always good to make sure. And, and especially, you know, if anyone saw the Omicron, Masks were scarce to be found in almost anywhere in the world at that time. But uh, stocks looks like it are returning. I, I'm starting to see selectively that the N91, the 9105 is available, but still a little tough to get right now. I think that's going to be one, I think, going forward, one of the, the big challenges. And it's probably the most frequent. Well, there's usually the first question is, what should I wear? Where can I get it? And then how do I know it's real? So it's it's one of those top three questions you're tackling. So it's great to hear that 3M is looking at a way to sell it, to make it easier for the consumer uh, to be able to select a, a mask. Now, the fourth question that I normally get is, how long can I wear it, right? So one of the questions we have, you know, we, we use this word, you know, sometimes I hear people say single use respirators, which I think the technical term is disposable, which I think has a slightly different connotation in terms of its use. And I think 3M did issue some guidance on this, but I thought, well, I'd love to hear it from you. Like, can we reuse these? And what are some of the guidelines and what are some of the things we should look at when we're talking about reuse of, of these type of respirators? So yes, you can reuse these. You can reuse N95 respirators. The single use term is, is in a few healthcare regulations. And it also was part of the early regulations in the 1970s that we talked about earlier. So I think one of the, the difficulties we've had with, with the guidance throughout this pandemic is the majority of the guidance initially was offered for healthcare. And it was really directed at doctors and nurses. And then employers in other areas and the general public tried to figure out how to adapt healthcare guidance to themselves. Okay. And so when we think about the single use, that's really, that's really coming from the healthcare industry where there are, if it does get covered in, in blood, it, it, you have to throw it away. <laughs> That'd be, yes, you definitely, you definitely want to throw that away. <laughs> and so really when we think about single use, what we're saying with these types of filtering face pieces is you can't wash them. So you can't wash them, but you can reuse them. And, and for the public, for, for healthcare, for a lot of applications, the, the dust levels are very low. The particles are very low that, that get captured by this filter. Okay. And there's, there's 
four, four times to get a new respirator, okay? If it gets really dirty. So sometimes I see people walking around it and this, these white respirators look very brown. My guess is they've probably come right from a construction site and they're wearing them at the grocery store. If, yeah. if this is really getting really discolored, it's, it's really dirty and then it's probably time to get a new one. Okay. If it becomes damaged. So if you see a strap break, if your nose clip breaks, if the nose foam falls off, then it's time to get a new respirator. Or if it becomes difficult to breathe through. And that's gonna happen for certain workplaces where there are higher dust levels. It's not going to probably happen, get enough particles in there to be difficult to breathe through when you're just going to the grocery store um, or if you're wearing it you know, at a job where there's really not a lot of dust. And the fourth and, and reason is if it doesn't seal to your face anymore. So if that nose clip just doesn't bend anymore because you've, you've bent it a number of times or the headbands are too stretchy. So when you put it on, it, it kind of falls away from your face. If you don't feel like it's touching your face all the way around, which forces the air through the filter, then it's time to get a new one. Okay, wow, that's that, I mean, that's really good. I mean, I think uh, it's something I, I talked about early and took a roll the dice on, uh, <laughs> but it sounds like there is some science that backs that up and other people have looked at that. Uh, when we talk about the, 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 the challenge of like hard to breathe in and really dirty. So for the masters out there, you know, one of the criteria in, in the NIOSH testing is a 200 milligram loading. Um, so is that tied to that, 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 in terms of like when you're saying it, you can wear it until it's hard to bring, is it really tied because at some point in time it got tested to a really high loading level and we, we know that that in most workplace settings is very hard to achieve or how do, how do you kind of, how, from a science standpoint, how do, how do we know that? Um, so I think there, there's a couple, a couple things going on there. The test with the high loading is really designed to make sure that the respirator filter can perform at all different types of dust levels. And, and there's, we can get real deep in the science of filtration if you want. Um, but the short answer is that's to make sure that this respirator can, can perform well at very light dust levels, but also as it loads up, that it continues to hold that efficiency. And, and the reason that we say you should change these respirators out when they get difficult to breathe through, rather than telling you, you should change them out when they're loaded with 30 milligrams you know, 30 milligrams of dust or 100 milligrams of dust is that we are all individual. You know, yeah. I'm probably if I go walk around in a in a construction site, I might be one of the smaller people. And so when it gets certain amounts of dust, because my lungs are smaller, I might find it more difficult to breathe through at the same dust level than somebody who is, you know, six foot four and has really big lungs. Okay. And so it's really a... Um, a personal thing, but what, what makes it difficult to breathe through is dust loading. And so if you're on a very dusty construction site, I mean, we've seen guys and, you know, you drive down the road and guys are just in a cloud of dust, right? And, yeah. and their respirators filtering out all that dust that they may get to the point of, of finding it difficult to breathe through after four hours, right? At lunch, they might have to get a new one. But if you're wearing it to the grocery store and you're taking good care of, your respirator, you're treating it nicely, you're not shoving it in your pocket or your cup holder, uh, you might be able to wear it a number of times going in and out of a store or, you know, for places where you're not, you're not getting it dirty. And, and so that key thing for the, for the for a general public that's not using it in a really dusty condition, an office place, a grocery store, is really watching about how this mask is going to lose its shape, whether the nose wire is still sealing tightly to your face, and whether those those headbands are breaking or or getting so stretched out, you no longer feel it sealing tightly to your face. That's what I understand, correct? That is correct. And that's, you know, when we look at a difference between a mask, a true mask that's supposed to be loose fitting, right? It's not designed to seal to your face, and a respirator that that's designed to touch, you know, all the way around your face. A mask, it's a, if you crumple it up and, and it's still loose against your face, that's okay. That's how it's designed. But these, these different respirators, like your V-Flex and these Auras, these cup-shaped ones, uh, they look like really simple devices. And we put 50 years into making them look like simple devices, but they're actually really complex devices to help protect your lungs. And so you need to treat them 
you know, between uses, if you want to reuse it, treat it carefully, right? Don't fold it up. Don't shove it in your pocket. Don't shove it in your purse. Um, you know, treat it nicely. Let it dry out. Keep it somewhere clean. So, so that brings me to one of the questions I get a lot too is, if these uh, devices get damp, let's say I'm walking in the rain or I inadvertently sneeze in it, ugh, uh, <laughs> we've all been there. The, the, the smell we're not gonna talk about, but the, the accidental dampness, does that mean that the respirator no longer is functional and you immediately throw it away? Or what's the, what's the use case in terms of like getting it damp? Maybe not, we're not talking about immersing or, or washing because we definitely know we don't wanna do that, but you know, general wear in a, in a rainy day or something like that. Yeah, and, and again, I'm going to make sure that, that we're just talking about N95 respirators. Yes. Yeah. Because N95 respirators are tested by the government under a lot of conditions. And they are tested um, after being stored at very high humidity and warm conditions to make sure that even when they are damp, even if you've you know been in a light mist or you sneeze in them or, or you get sprayed by a light mist, that they are still going to filter efficiently. Okay. And so, you know, I, I wear the, I just wore one back from spring break on a long flight and yeah, it was damp. I sneezed in it and, you know, then I took it home and dried it out and, and let it breathe a little bit. And then I wore it to work this morning. That's great. To, I mean, that's great to hear because I think it's one of the most common questions. I haven't been able to test that myself. Uh, directly just because I haven't had enough time and you really need some specialty equipment to test it. You know, I think it's 80, is it 85% relative humidity? And, and what, what is that NIOSH test criteria for the- oh, I looked it up. I'm not sure I can get it exact with the temperature, but I believe it is 85% relative humidity um, for more than 24 hours. And the temperature I think is up in the 80, I'd have to look to make yeah, it. Yeah, it's okay. When we start talking about uh, respirators that we talked about, so we covered you know, the V-Flex and stuff, one of the questions I also hear a lot about is, you know, the different series of masks and how do we know which ones fit our face? So like, for example, the Aura series, I think there's a few different styles of this mask. There's like the 1870, the 9205 plus, and there's also another one with white banded strips, but I can't remember the name off the top of my head. Are they all different in terms of the sizing or are all those masks actually the same size and just kind of like, tell me a little bit about that. So it really differs by the respirator that we're talking about. Okay. For the Aura respirator, we do, the, the face piece is really the same. So the face piece is the same. What you, you see differences in, in uh, the 1870 is a surgical N95. So it's been tested a little bit differently. We have different quality systems for it to match the FDA requirements. Um, and then like you mentioned, the 9210 plus and the 9205 plus are really the same face piece, but they have some different straps. Okay. Some okay. people really like these, these polyisoprene smooth straps, and some people really like the braided, more elastic type straps. So that's a personal preference. And, and then we also have some of these with valves on them. A lot of workers at hot, hot jobs, if you're outside, if you're in a foundry, having that valve really helps um, you not feel so hot on your face in a hot job. So we have a variety of um, different models for different applications or just different user preferences. But we do have different styles of these respirators. So as, as you saw, this is a, a flat fold. Um, and then you've got your V-Flex, which is also a flat fold, but it looks different. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about this. So, so it turns out those Aura series are pretty much all the same. There are some, some small minor technical differences in terms of banding or maybe they're surgical, but then there are so many other 3M masks, right? Uh, and, and I think I once, I mean, I haven't acquired the full collection. Uh, some of them are even really hard to get. Why do all these different masks? Why don't we just have one mask uh, and call it good? Why do we have so many variety at 3M and what, dr what drives that? So there's a couple different things that drive that. One you mentioned already is fit. And so some of our respirators come in two sizes, like the V-Flex has a small and a sort of medium large size. And the medium large size actually fits a huge range of faces, but there are some people with such petite faces that they do need a small size. Our cup shaped uh, respirators come in a small size as well. And we have those sizes obviously because people have different faces. Um, 
But we also have the different sort of designs of the respirators, just because there are a lot of different people in the world. And, you know, we make our respirators for the U.S. here in the U.S., for the U.S. population. But even the U.S. population is very diverse. Mm -hmm. And the types of jobs people use them at are, are very diverse. Some people like a flat fold. They can, you know, when it's, when it's clean and they haven't used it yet, they can tuck it in their pocket and whip it out or their purse. Um, you know, a lot of, of people like these, some, you know, you'll see a lot of, of workers. This is the one we introduced or the, the style we introduced 50 years ago. And so there's a lot of companies that have been using this style for 50 years. And that's what they like. We also have a lot of specialty respirators for specialty jobs. So some have some carbon in them in case there's odors in the, the workplace. Uh, some of them are designed to have, you know, wear while you're welding. If metal sparks come at you, you want to make sure that you don't start on fire. So we have a lot of them because there's just a lot of diverse people in the world. And there's a lot of diverse workers doing diverse jobs. And so we want to make sure that, you know, you, people can find the one that is right for their job, but also feels comfortable to them and fits their face. Okay, that, that makes sense. So I think one of the questions that I get most uh, asked most frequently is, what's the mask that fits the widest face? Like, so if you're a person that's mask naive, you have or a respirator naive, and you've never really bought one, what do you think is the mask that fit the most faces? Now we can't, of course, guarantee that it fits all faces, but from your experience, which ones kind of really fit those really wide categories in terms of face sizes and features from your experience? I would say the, the one that we have um, really done a lot of research on to be a one size fits most. We're never gonna say one size fits all, <laughs> but one size fits most is that Aura platform. As I mentioned, that Aura comes only in, in one size and we've done a lot of research um, to make sure that it can form a seal to the face for smaller faces all the way up to the, the really large faces and faces of, you know, just really different people. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you some questions that you may not know, but I have to ask them. In your opinion, what <laughs> mask do you think is the best for the smallest face? So people have a petite face. What would you go for? So I would recommend people with really petite faces. Um, try either the Aura, because again, we found this does fit on really small faces, or look at the 8110S, which is a cup shape. Okay. Now, as we mentioned, the V-Flex also comes in a small size, which is a great choice, but we, we don't have as many of those readily available right now as we do the Aura or the 8110S. Okay, so-, so That's for the US. We might yeah. have different models numbers in different parts of the world, but those are the ones we make in the U.S. for the U.S. population. And I think that's okay for today's call. I think if in general, we, if we need to, we can, we can add the links to sort of those equivalent uh, international options. Um, so now the other end of the spectrum, and one of the things that I actually is probably the hardest for me to answer is the really big faces. Because I think uh, some people, you know, it's, it, when you start talking big faces, it starts to give different geometry, right? Nose bridge to chin or maybe a wider face. In your experience, what are some of the masks that fit onto the larger size of those? Or what does 3M offer in that kind of space? Yeah, again, I'm going to go back to a lot of our, our um, respirators do fit, do form a seal to the larger face quite well. Okay. And so we've got something like the 80 uh, to 10 here, which is the cup shaped, or again, back to the Aura, the standard side is V Flex. Um, it really comes down, I think, in the end, especially for the bigger faces, to the comfort okay. and what is more comfortable for the person. We also have one called the 8511. Now, that has a valve, so that's great for, for certain workplaces. Um, but there are some places in the country that are still you know, not allowing valves. Um, but that's where we have these different strap options, right? Because some of those straps might be more comfortable on the really mm. big faces. So that's where if, if you... If you Again, you know, if it's a short period of time you're wearing it, you might be able to, to tolerate a little bit of, of tightness to run into the store. But if you're on a construction site and you're going to wear this for eight hours straight, you're going to want to find something that's comfortable. And you might have to try a couple different strap options. Okay, so that's interesting. So, so what you're saying is that mass comfort isn't just dictated by the shape of the respirator itself, but also the straps play a role. And so looking at different options, so even the Aura series with the braided strap versus the, I can't remember what the material called, the ISO. Poly isoprene. 
Oh, polyisoprene. That's a new one for me today. So polyisoprene it's strap. It's a smooth strap. Think of it as the smooth strap. Okay. Yeah. So those might be a, an option for people. So that's very interesting. Okay, so we are gonna jump into a little bit of some serious mass nerding out here. Okay. Um, so one of the questions I get all the time, this is a really fun one. So uh, Target for a long, and, and many other retailers has carried the 3M AFFM mask. Now this is a mask that was certified to the F3502 barrier face covering uh, standard, which that's a whole topic in itself about a fun a kind of interesting standard that kind of played out there with the cloth mask and this. Uh, I, uh, we, and I'm going to assume that part of that was driven because this was an ear loop and mask clip. For those who aren't aware, N95s are almost exclusively, uh, actually are exclusively head strap uh, options. And so this is a, a earpiece or a clip style respirator. But then we have the 3M uh, KF94. They look very, very similar. And I've also seen the 9513. Are these all the same device? Or do you make custom versions for each one of these? I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, those are all very, uh, they're a platform. We usually call them a platform or a family okay. of products where you see very similar looking products so that we can leverage our, our knowledge of the materials and the fit and the manufacturing. Um, and that actually is designed to be worn with that clip. So not as an ear loop. So it's, you've okay. got to use the clip. Okay. Um, and so the, the white one there that you've got is, is the advanced filtering face piece. Uh, which is designed to be a mask. It's not a respirator. So it's oh, really okay. designed to, you know, be block your sneeze, block your cough, right? Also um, be a barrier if any big splashes came at you. And the KF94, so that that one, that AFFM is um, yep, tested at a certified lab to meet the barrier face covering standard. And that's a U.S. standard. Now, the KF94, which you mentioned does look similar. Is yeah, they look, very, they look very, very similar in terms of the design. This one has a port test in it because I only had one of them. They're hard to get from South Korea sometimes. <laughs> yeah, so that is a product that's made to the KF94 standard, which is a standard for the public in Korea. It's sometimes called the yellow dust standard, and it's for, you know, air pollution. Now, those are different standards, so they've been tested differently differently. They might have some differences. I'm, I'm not sure of the internal design of them, but we're leveraging that design. Okay. So they aren't identical because one is certified to a Korean standard, one is tested to the US standard. And then as you mentioned, there is a KN95, which is certified to the uh, GB standard, the GB2626 standard, uh, which is the standard for China. Okay. It's their national standard for respiratory protection. And so these masks get assigned unique part numbers because the test standard that they actually went to were specific to that mask. So they may share very similar or there might be some small differences internally to help them meet some specific test standard. Uh, and that's why you assign them a unique part number than at 3M. Correct. And they'll have different user instructions based on if they're, you know, aiming towards workers, aiming towards healthcare, uh, for public use, obviously different languages. Um, <laughs> And, and there, there may be slight differences, as you mentioned, because of each country is having their own standards. And sometimes they have even multiple standards, like Korea. Korea has a, a separate standard for workers. And then they have the KF94 for the public. In mm, places okay. like um, China, that KN95 standard is, is not specific to a, a worker or to a public. Um, and so it's it's just for a respirator standard. So you see little okay. differences in the standards around the world for performance, but there are some big differences in how the approval takes place. For example, the U.S. government um, audits the factories where we make the products, where we make the N95s. They require that we submit a, a thorough quality plan to them and user instructions. In other parts of the world, it might just be the, the filtration and, and breathability testing without the factory audits and all of those things. So each country's standard, it, it might look similar with filtration, but they all have different requirements sort of behind the scenes. Hmm. Okay. No, that's interesting. Um, so I'm going I'm to put you on the spot for this one. Now, this is a mask that a lot of people liked and then disappeared. The 9502 Plus, this was a, a NIOSH N95 bifold style became very popular. A lot of people bought it and liked it. And suddenly no one can buy them anymore. 
Any details about what happened to that mask? Will it be something that's similar to it or is it gonna come back sometime? So that is a respirator that we made in China. It's made in China. It's originally a KN95, um, but the NIOSH approval is valued all over the world. So sometimes we have products that are NIOSH approved as well as locally approved. I see. And so, uh, during the height of the, you know, really at the beginning of the pandemic, China was was the most affected place, and China was buying up respirators out of the U.S. and respirators out of Europe. And then, as as China cases came down and U.S. cases came up, we looked to see are there any products that we're making in China that we can bring here? Because oh, traditionally, our resp our NIOSH approved respirators for the U.S. are made here in the U.S. Mm. So we make our, our respirators for the U.S. population here in the U.S. And we make our respirators for Europe in Europe and our respirators for China in China. But at the height of the pandemic, when U.S. and, and Latin America and Asia and every, every place else was you know, really high, we looked at how could we leverage our global respirator use. So we brought that over for a limited time from China since it had the appropriate NIOSH approval. Um, and we did make it available to help augment just the, the overall supply. Oh, okay. But now that we have... Um, you know, more availability of all the types of the respirators. We increased our manufacturing and cases have come down. Thank goodness. Yeah. Uh, we're really focused on supplying the U.S., you know, with you with products made here in the U.S. And uh, China's having, a, you know, a surge right now. And so we're focusing on the products that we make in China back towards China like we traditionally do. Okay, that makes a lot of sense why well, we suddenly saw them come onto the market because I not a respirator I ever saw, a bifold I saw was made in China, but that, that makes sense. You're trying to leverage the, the 3M's supply chain around the world to, to move supply in and out of countries that were being affected by the pandemic. Um, I also thought that was really interesting that people value that NIOSH N95 outside of the US as well, which I thought is, that's an interesting point. I didn't quite think about that. So that makes sense that it was NIOSH N95, but it was never really meant for the US market, but it was a nice badge of, uh, of quality by having that a NIOSH approved respirator. Um, so I think that kind of brings me to the, the next kind of section I want to talk about, which is how does 3M, so we talk about, you know, the impact of COVID and all these respirators having to move around from different countries and, and suddenly the uh, adaptation of respirators by people that normally wouldn't wear them, right? So uh, when you start talking about now going to grocery stores and wearing an N95, how do you see the future of general public masking and what do you see 3M's role in that? Yeah, you know, my whole career, um, I really wished more and more people knew about N95s, and um, my wish has come true. I wish I didn't have to do it through a global pandemic. Um, you know, we've seen increasing use of N95 respirators or, or you know, respiratory protection by the public um, over at least my, my time in this field, as we do see their use for heavy wildfire seasons right, or volcanic ash when we have volcanoes erupt. There's been an increasing awareness of the public through air pollution in some parts of the world. And, um, and that, I think, has really, you know, allowed the, the public to make that connection between good respiratory health in their workplace and then what happens with their home and their family. Because there are a lot of people who have to wear respirators at work every day or maybe just occasionally at work, but they have to wear them. And, and now they're making that connection between you know, what's happening inside of work and outside of work. I am, I am hoping that um, we don't have to wear respirators or masks every day for everything. Uh, I'm hoping, knock on wood, <laughs> that, that the cases continue to come down and, and vaccination increases and you know, we have fewer wildfires and fewer volcanoes. Um, but I do think that what we've learned about, you know, what the, what the world has learned about respiratory protection, about N95s, um, is going to be helpful when we do have to use them. If there's a surge in COVID or another outbreak of some other disease or a wildfire, I'm hoping that, that people will ab be able to more quickly make a decision of when they need to, to personally protect themselves and their family or workers will be more educated about why they're being asked to wear these at work. So I'm, I think 3M is, has a big role in this going forward. We're a leading manufacturer. Um, you know, and when I, when I look at the United States, we, 
We make our respirators here in the U.S. for the U.S. people. And, and we learned a lot through the pandemic. We keep learning every day about how to talk about respirators, how to talk about respirators versus masks, how to, to try to make the, you know, the way we talk about them more digestible for people. And I think we're, we're also hoping to see the U.S. government take, take a bigger role in, in the, you know, the general public. A lot of the guidance is aimed right at healthcare still, and and hoping that the U.S. government continues to, you know, even as the pandemic hopefully <laughs> sort of winds down, that they they continue to think, you know, beyond healthcare into other employers, and then into the public and, and everyday life. So I'm I'm hoping we have better, you know, we continue to improve our education. I'm hoping we continue to innovate on the products. Um, and I'm hoping that the world doesn't forget about N95 respirators um, during those times that we don't need them. And I hope the times that we don't need them are a lot bigger than the times we do. But I'm hoping we can learn from this and then, again, make better, quicker decisions when we do have, you know, natural disasters or disease outbreaks or other unfortunate events. No, I, and I agree. I mean, I think one of the interesting things that are one of the positive things that came out of the pandemic is the is the considerations over respiratory protection right outside of just COVID right now people are aware of a product that during a wildfire they may want to consider to wear because you know these kind of things can lead to, to health consequences if you're constantly exposed to you know uh, air pollution or or and or wildfire smoke or other things but when we talk about the general public mask I got a, I got a really tough question for you and I think there's a lot of people that are going back and forth on this one industrial hygienists and and people that are looking at this and this is an ear loop respirator. So, you know, the KN95, the ubiquitous KN95, we've seen them everywhere. And, and I think there's this real challenge that the head strap versus ear loop camp, right? How do you see the role of ear loop masks as maybe just, I mean, I don't think 3M makes any, at least none that I'm aware of, oh, sorry, 3M, <laughs> excuse me, ear loop respirator. I'll be respirator. 3M might make a, a surgical mask, I'm not sure, but uh, three, an ear loop respirator. How do you see that tie up? Do you see, do you see that standard over something or would you, does 3M want to see that? I know they do make ear loop respirators in China. I believe there are 3M KN95s. How do you see that standard and how do you see that coming into the US? Do you think that's something that'll get adopted here? So NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Health and Safety, is to, to the best of our understanding, working on um, building fit into the regulation that they approve N95s. And when they're able to build that in, then I think we're going to see um, a lot of flexibility for respirators and how they're designed. Um, other countries such as China and Europe actually do test the fit of the respirator on people as part of the certification. So when they make those respirators available to workers or the public, they, they have some confirmation that some portion of the population can fit into the respirator, form that seal, right? So that the air, a lot, the majority of the air is going through the filter media. And we haven't really talked about it today, but even a really small leak even a day's growth of stubble is going to cause leaks around the edge and allow those super small particles to just sneak around the edge. And, and so um, that's part of why other parts of the world can have ear loops is because they test those ear loop products to make sure that there's a portion of the population that can fit those products really, really well. Mm, okay. In the U.S., because respirator use has mainly historically been by workers, NIOSH has not tested the fit as part of the approval process because the employer has to test the fit on each individual before they wear the respirator. Now that we have, you know, more use by people outside of work or more what we call voluntary use, um, we found a lot of the products that were coming into the United States we're not able to pass a fit test. And so employers were, were having trouble getting respirators. They were buying respirators you know, from other countries that had ear loops and finding nobody could use them. And, and so that's really, I think, you know, where we are today, where NIOSH is, is really not looking at ear loops. But when they're able to build in a standard for um, fit into the 
performance, then they can make sure that before they stamp N95 on it, that it does fit at least some people and is going to be protective for some people. And then I think we're going to see ear loop N95s. Mm, now, okay. I don't know if that's going to be you know, in six months or a year, but NIOSH has talked about it a number of times and there is an ASTM standard out that they're looking at. So I'm hoping that that comes in the next year or two so that we do have you know, flexibility of design for respirators because I think that benefits everyone. No, I, I agree. I'm a, big, I'm a big fan of a lot of different options uh, and then people can pick what, what works best for them. And what we really just need to ensure is that everyone gets a high quality product. So some standard that we can test against so we know that we're getting high quality products some regulatory agency that's overseeing that. At the end of the day, Let's have some flexibility, which brings me to the next question. 3M loves white masks and a few black because you can barely get that KF94 to black. Do you see a future of colored masks from 3M that are other than white? I'm, I'm very, yeah, I'm a person that really likes colored masks. So I'd love to hear it from the experts themselves. I would say that, you know, historically, like we talked about, the, the general or standard use respirators were, were used by employers. And if you look across the respiratory protection market in the US, it is mainly white. Uh, we do have some that are, are light blue, that are light green, that are gray. Um, during the pandemic, honestly, we were focused on quantity, right? And I mean, quality and quantity. Yeah. Just uh, need and to when get you start changing up colors, you start, you know, slowing down production, uh, typically having to source different raw materials. Uh, so I think now as, as we're coming into, hopefully in the U.S., um, a time where where we can have, you know, appropriate levels of respirators. I think we're going to be looking, you know, really what is the future of respirators and those people who are using them. What what is their voice? Do they want colors? If we go back mainly to just workers, you know, and they want white, uh, that's what would be. But we're really open to listening to the voices of everyone who are using 3M products. No, oh, that's exciting. I mean, I really, I really hope you can make some really cool stuff. I, you know, the printed mask thing to me, I think the the cloth mask people really like design because it became a fashion accessory for them, right? You've got to, we're all having the mask, so why not make it cool? So I really hope that at some point in time, the convergence of design and engineering come together to form the ultimate super respirator uh, that we can all wear. Well, I think we have just a, one more minute left. I was going to ask the question about what your favorite international respirator standard was because that's a good nerdy question. But actually, I changed my mind. So we're going to do a last minute audible. And that is when we talk about fit, I think this is one of the most frequent questions I get uh, that I didn't put in my long list of questions that I had for you, which is uh, when we talk about general public mask wearing, especially in 95s, right? We've kind of, I think everyone's kind of acknowledged that you don't need to be fitted to receive some protection from wearing an N95, and that you do need to be fitted. If you want to get that maximum level, you want to get a fit factor of 100, then you do need to be professionally fitted. But a general public can you know, get some benefit in wearing that. Does 3M plan to look more so at general public uh, fitting? And I know there's some work that Lisa Brassau has done in the past, but it seems like it's a little light in terms of fitting naive people with masks. Something 3M gonna look at in the future? You know, we are always looking at fit. And we're looking at fit of novice, what we call novice populations. And we're looking at fit of very experienced populations. Uh, I'm here in our, I'm in an office, but right down the, the hall from our global fit test lab. Um, all through the pandemic, I've been here every weekday and some weekends. Um, we've been running, we run human subject fit testing here in the US um, continuously to really understand um, how people who are experienced with respirators react to the respirators, how people who are new and have never worn one before, how they do it. We try out our user instructions. Certainly, if we make any changes, you know, to a new strap or a, a new um, product, uh, but I think we so we do look at that. We just maybe don't share it as as well as we need to. Okay. Um, well, but I, I would. As if the U.S. comes out with standards for the general public, right? Then you're going to see a lot more research around public use of respirators. But I know I just if I can do one last thing. It's really for, for anybody um, watching, thank you first for getting through this far into the mass nerd um, interview. It's been, it's been really fun for me, but please, 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 if you get an N95, please use both head straps. Please, <laughs> please put one on the top of your head and one around your neck. 
And then take that nose clip and, and form it with two fingers. Because if you get an N95 and you want to protect your lungs, you know, help reduce the particles you're breathing in, then you might as well wear it right with both straps and pressing the nose clip. I just, and if I approach you on the street and ask you to wear it right, please forgive me. But. Well, I mean, I think if, if you're going to be the one to tell anyone, I think you might have the expertise uh, and the accolades and, and the sort of the, you know, the, the ability to say, hey, here's my 3M business card. I might know a few things about N95s. I am shocked all the time about the creative ways that people have found to wear N95s in terms of strapping. Some things I never thought you could do, but it turns out apparently you can, uh, including, you know, the single strap going down the back of the neck with the other one dangling. Uh, of course, you know, I've seen... Oh, I've seen the double strap over the same portion. So they just put two on top of each other and they're just like right cutting off their ears. So yes, I think uh, I think there's a lot of work still in uh, explaining to people, the general public, how to wear respirators and some of this. It'll be something that I hopefully will keep working on uh, and your help in this Nikki has been very, uh, your, 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 excuse me, your time spent talking to you has been very helpful in helping some of those people understand some of the kind of nuances that we have. Because I feel like this is a very new topic for a lot of people. It was, I mean, I was familiar with them, uh, but now uh, almost a year or 18 months later, I feel like I'm starting to get the grasp of what are those key things? And I hope that we can share that with other people and they can become mega mass nerds themselves. So uh, Nikki, thank you again so much for your time. Uh, again, we'll have links in the description for anything we talked about. Is there any last things you'd like to finish up with, Nikki? You made your last call to, for people to wear their straps right. Was there any other thing that you would want a fellow mass nerd to know? Um, you know, I think we've we've covered the range of it. Uh, you know, if you're if you're looking to to reduce particles in the air that that might get into your nose and lungs, you know, pick up an N95 um, that seems authentic and um, use both straps. Form that nose clip. Read the instructions. Go online and find videos about it. Listen to the mass nerd, obviously. Uh, but thank you, thank you so much, Aaron, for your time, uh, taking the time to spend with me today. Uh, I'm very passionate on this topic, and I'm thankful that there are people like you that are out there trying to, to spread the word to help people make choices, the right choices, and, and become more educated. So seriously, thank you so much. Ah, it's my pleasure. It's fun to, to get to talk about really nerdy stuff. I do hope someday that that mass fitting laboratory, I've seen some videos on YouTube where the people kind of touch around that, but I'm I would love to see that uh, firsthand, what all goes into a real big fitment. Maybe you've seen the video of my bathroom, not quite probably to the same level as what is at 3M. So thank you very much, Nikki. And uh, for everyone else, thanks so much for hanging around and watching a good Mass Nerd video.